Here's a couple examples of sequence motifs using the, um, using the, the, the seek logo paradigm of making a sequence taller or shorter based on how prevalent it, it is in a particular motif. And so what you can see is really there's some information right around where the donor site is, the canonical uh, uh, GT or, or, or GC donor sites, but there's also some minor sites that, that, that happen based on, on, on what kind of splicing happens. Um, but the acceptor site, so after that, that GT, which by itself, two nucleotides is not a whole lot of information. GT happens a whole lot of time. After that, the, the sort of conservation around that donor site gets, gets very, very weak. And so the amount of signal that we have to, to distinguish donor and acceptor site are, are very tricky. So, so introns are the major problems <coughs> simply because once, because that, that transition between coding sequence and non-coding sequence is very tricky to, to, to pick up exactly when it's going to, to, to happen. So a very simple uh, HMM that you can build is something where you say, well, there's, first of all, upstream five prime sequence, five prime UTR before the, um, before the start codon. The start codon then, and, and, and by the way, this is a, a coding start. So, so HEG, you know, so not a, um, not a uh, transcriptional start site, but a translational start site, okay? Um, so start codon, exon, splice site, intron, so one or more possibilities of going through this, uh, this little diamond here to, to include one or more introns before, the, before then finding a stop codon and talking about downstream UTR. So that's a very simple one. That's, that doesn't actually work very well. Um, what does work is something that uh, uh, Chris Burge at, at, at MIT came up with. It was an HMM called, called GenScan. And this is the GenScan topology. It was, it was the first, I'd say, the first successful gene finder, or the first wildly successful gene finder. There were some, some, some earlier gene finders that, that did a pretty good job, but this really, this really uh, was, a, was a breakout success for, for eukaryotic gene finding. And the idea was that you start in the, here in this intergenic region, and then either on the forward strand or the reverse strand, so this is a, essentially a mirror copy of everything that's up here, but just on the opposite orientation. Because of course, as you're scanning along the genome from left to right, it's easy to talk about, oh, I'm gonna go to the start codon, and then the this, and then that, and finally end with the stop codon, five prime to three prime. But if there's a gene on the reverse strand, then you actually have to do all that backwards. You have to look for the three prime, and then the stop codon, and then some other stuff, and then the start codon, and all of the codons are now reverse complement to each other. So you essentially need a different set of, of parameters to handle the reverse strand and the forward strand. But the idea is that you have intergenic, you then might have some promoter recognition, five prime UTR, an initial exon, and that initial exon is different from intermediate exons. And a lot of the complexity here is all about phasing, right? That intron can be a phase zero, phase one, or phase two intron. A phase zero intron is one that does not interrupt the reading frame. A phase one intron is one where the, f the initial exon has one base of the next codon, and the next exon must have the, the corresponding two bases to, to start with. And by doing that, some of the puzzling out about where the intron donor and acceptor sites were this structure, the structure of this graph, allowed the, easy, the problem to become just that little bit more easy. Because if you saw some coding potential in one exon and some coding potential in the other exon, then to get the two of them in frame with respect to each other, you had to use the correct, um, the correct splice site that would actually maintain the, maintain the frame. So, the, so to get the right, to get the right um, intron phase in place. So three different kinds of intron phases, and then depending on what uh, depending on which phase you went to, you then go to different exons, and depending on which exon you're, you're in, what reading frame you're in, you may or may not go to, to, to different intron phases. Finally, at the end of the day, you'll get to a terminal exon, uh, uh, three prime, UTR, poly A, single, uh, signal, and you're done. GenScan also allowed separately the idea for single exon genes that would simply not at all have any of the, the potential for allowing introns where, because essentially one of the earlier problems with this model is that single exon genes, the models very much wanted to try to put an intron in there and just couldn't. And so ended up making these kind of silly things where there'd be a, you know, a, a, a 20 base pair intron in the, in the, in the middle of a, of a gene. So 
This was the GenScan um, topology. Uh, SNAP was, a, was a, another gene finder that, 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 that Ian Korf invented a few years later, which used much of the same guts. But the thing that was different was instead of using three different intron phases, it actually used six different intron phases um, of, of, of phase zero where there's no interruption, and then two different uh, phase one, and then three different phase twos that ensured that when you put, when you stitch things back together, you did not introduce a stop codon. Because one of the problems with, with GenScan was that it would happily go through and, and, and stitch together a coding region, but then it would accidentally have some, some stop codons coded over, over the boundary of the, of the intron. So SNAP was able to, to fix that by essentially making this graph just a little bit more complicated. So here the example is that the, the statistical model of the HMM, the topology, was actually able to encode more of the biological information that, that we knew a gene should, should have, and by so doing, be, just eke out that much, more, that much more statistical power to be able to, to detect genes. Okay. What were the observable um, states? In just the DNA sequence. Right, that's right. So, so the idea is that, um, so each of these states emits, uh, emits a labeling. So the label here would be, would be exon phase zero. But the only way that it would emit exon phase zero is if it had observations that were consistent with the emissions of what an exon phase zero should look like. So that would be, um, so as we talked about before, a kind of third order or sixth order Markov model that captures the codon table frequency and the, and the di amino acid frequency that tends to be seen in coding sequences. So just like in the bacterial world, we used sequence similarity and homology to help inform about gene structure. Um, the same idea uh, is, is appealing in, in eukaryotic genomes to say, well, I've got the DNA sequence and maybe even the annotation from some other genome that is closely related, if I could have just aligned those two genomes, could I then transfer the exon intron structure from one to the other? And that's the, the idea of so-called comparative ab initio methods where I could even, even if the other DNA sequence in fact did not have any annotation on it, I could say I could use the annotation, or I could say, you know what, I'm gonna ignore its annotation because this annotation might be wrong too. But where there's conservation, where there's excess patterns of conservation, driven by protein coding sequence, I should be able to detect that based on the DNA sequence alignment and be able to make predictions about matching exons, mixing uh, 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 missed exons, and then donor, um, donor acceptor splice sites through the, through the introns. And double scan was the first example of a, of a tool uh, to do this. Um, uh, Ermitraud Meyer from, from Richard Durbin's group this. And again, it's a, just an overly complicated hidden Markov model that is now trying to simultaneously across two genomes simultaneously make exon intron boundary calculations where now the emissions are not the DNA sequence but the pairwise alignment between those two genomes. So the idea was that you would align the two genomes and the series of match and mismatch states of those two alignments would help inform you whether you were in an exon or, or intron boundary. Twin scan was finally, sorry, go ahead. So much sequence expression data there, so. You like why not just use, why not just use RNA-seq now just to, and not worry about this? What a great question. I am gonna nail that to the ground tomorrow when I talk to, about RNA-seq, okay? These well, tools, the, 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 the short answer is these tools are still relevant um, because RNA-seq gives you a lot of evidence for gene structure, but it doesn't give you the complete gene structure. Oh, sure, definitely. And, and we'll, get to, we'll get to methods that actually take into account other sources of, of evidence, too. Yeah, but this is still in the kind of, this was, uh, you know, 2004, so uh, yes, there was EST data and some cDNA, but that was still actually fairly, fairly limiting, pre-RNA-seq pre days. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, twin scan took that idea one step further and said, look, if I look at a pairwise you know, genomic alignment between two pieces of DNA sequence, and if I see match, match, mismatch, match, match, mismatch, match, match, mismatch, that's, that's the codon table, right? That is the, you know, that must be coding sequence because particular, those particular patterns of, you know, frequent 
you know, you know uh, triplets or hexanucleotides where you have more matching, in, in, particularly in the first two bases and less matching in the third base, that reflects the redundancies in the, in the, in the codon table. And that, more likely than not, must be coding sequence. And therefore, I can use some other genome to inform the annotation of, of a genome of, of, of interest. And so, so twin scan was based on just looking at having one other so-called informant genome. End scan, the idea was that you could use multiple informant genomes. So there was a great paper where they looked at, at annotating the chicken genome using five or ten other uh, essentially mammalian genomes as the multiple informant genomes to the, to the chicken genome. And you can see as you go from gen scan, the sensitivity and the specificity for the, these things increase quite a bit as you go from twin scan to end scan. Note, however, that the, these sensitivity scores and specificity scores are still really bad, right? You know, 30 percent sensitivity. So 30 percent of the exon intron boundaries that are correct are being found and, you know, 20% of the things that are found are actually true. Okay, so sensitivity versus specificity. So and here's another look at this over time. Um, we get to end scan. Uh, uh, contrast is one of the, the, the newer. This ends in 2007, but I'll tell you, not much has changed. So a lot of, in the RNA-seq era, much of, of the kind of intellectual effort that used to go into, the, into gene finders has, has essentially dried up. Um, so, but the sort of gradual increase in, in p performance. But again, you know, 30% of, of the known um, open reframes being corrected in, in fly. Human, we started at 10% and we're now, or at least in 2007, up to about 45, 50% of the gene annotation. What you want to do is you want to combine gene evidence. You want to take transcripts aligned, whether they're EST or now RNA-seq, you want to take proteins. We can align proteins to genomes and see how they, how they align over exons and introns, right? And do that kind of spliced alignment. There are tools for that. Bill's tool does that. There, there are other tools that, that, that do that. Um, you want to take all this evidence. And in fact, you can, you can even do, there are things that say, well, I don't really know about the gene structure, but I can just go around and, and, and try and find splice sites. I can just mark all the possible places in the genome that might possibly be a splice site and use that as an extra piece of, of evidence. And then you would like to try to kind of sort through all this, all these different segmentations of the genome, and put them together. Um, and this is these, these combiners that, that do that. So this is the one that, that, that I was involved in. It was first called Glean, and then it was um, you know, later evolved into a tool called, called Evigen. The idea is that you have all these different sources of of evidence. These are all the observed pieces of data. And what's hidden is the consensus. And the idea is, well, if this truly is an exon, then it will tend to emit exon supporting evidence. And if this is truly an intron, then this, if this hidden, uh, uh, the, if the label to this segment, this hidden label is actually intron, then it should tend to produce or emit intron supporting evidence. So that's how these combiners work. So here, hidden labels and then emissions from each of those things with the idea that if I, if you said you were an exon previously, you're more likely to say you're an exon again. There's some, there's some spatial correlation in the data that you have to take into account of because each of those pieces of evidence is not, <coughs> is not independent. And those combiners, Evigen and, and, and Glean and, and, and others like it, um, do improve on both the exon transcript and gene level sensitivity and specificity, particularly, so not so much at, at the exon level, but particularly at the gene level. So the idea here is, here is how much of all of the sites in the gene do you actually get right? Do you get the entire gene right, or you're only getting pieces and, and, and parts of it right? So, um, the, other, the other game in town is, of course, the Ensemble and the UCSC genome browsers, which go to an extraordinary effort to annotate each, uh, the, the genomes in their collections for you and provide you know, a, a, a quite exhaustive pipeline of both sequence and homology-based uh, uh, annotation and also functional annotation of, of, of those things. These, um, for a while, there was an idea that these 
pipelines or tools were things that, that mere mortals could download and use. Um, I think for the most part that idea has, has evaporated. I don't know, are, are there people that download UCSC tools and build their own genome with it? Right. I can report on these two different pipelines that are that are stated here. Uh, we've re recently joined forces with Ensemble, and there is no longer a specific UCSC known genes pipeline. Uh, we now accept the genes from the GenCode consortium. Okay, great. So there's only one set of genes now. We will both display them on both browsers. Uh, the value add you get on each browser is what you see after you click through on a gene. Yeah. Uh, each click through. A massive amount of external information on every gene. So uh, they will look the same on the genome browsers, but when you click through, you'll get different types of information behind them. But we no longer have separate pipelines, we only one set of genes. Now. That's great, that's great. Because again, historically, there was this issue where if your genome, if your favorite genome of interest, happened to be under the, under the ensemble umbrella that an uh, ensemble decided to take you in and let you join the family, then you would have a set of gene predictions that were driven by the ensemble pipeline and the ensemble set of tools, and they're fine. And, and in general, what, what most people report is that the ensemble pipeline would generate far more transcripts for any given gene. It would tend to generate as many transcripts as it possibly could, and then try to annotate them as to whether they were well, uh, you know, well defined or well annotated or more kind of hypothetical or, or, or um, novel, sort of ambiguous. Historically, UC Santa Cruz gene production pipeline was a little bit more conservative and strict and said there had to be some overwhelming amount of evidence, EST or, 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 or otherwise, for us to make a call about, about a particular transcript ice form being there. And so you had these two sets of gene structures for any given organism and if you were going to design an experiment, you might be looking at both of them and having some difficulty resolving them. So this is great news that there's been some convergence on that, on that front. Yeah. The other take home message is that they're not, unfortunately, they're not, you know, the best way to use on the ensemble pipe, the ensemble UCSC joint pipeline is to become friends with ensemble and UCS and try to get them to do your genome for you. It's not something you can do yourself. So, so, so historically that was the case, but it sounds like now there's convergence. Right, so now with the convergence has happened, what's happened in the pipeline for the information given back? Is it taking more of a use, you know, maybe, 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 I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm not aware of the exact technical details of what they decided on. I do know that the Gen Code Consortium has more human curators in the pipeline, so there's a lot more human beings looking at the actual stuff to decide if it's true. Um, you still do get all of the extra stuff that Ensemble used to have, but we segregate that out. <coughs> and you'll see two different things. One is the really good set of genes, and then a whole bunch of other stuff below that. So we will separate that, those out into different categories. Um, and we always advise users, please look at your genes and decide on the evidence that you can see in front of you. The good thing about the browsers is you can turn on all the evidence. You can look at all the RNAs and the ESTs and all that stuff, and you can say, you can be your own curator at that point. You can decide this. I have some good evidence here, I know. And, and in your own lab experiments also, you can do your own evidence and place it on those browsers to see it yourself. So is this, is this convergence just for human and the, and the gen code annotate? Right, it's only human and mouse and maybe a couple of others. And okay. Stuff. okay, so this, the... the 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 mod encode or right. organisms. It's okay. Not no. It's not everything. Okay. Uh. Got it. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit al about alternative splicing. So alternative splicing is of course an issue for eukaryotic tr transcript annotation, right? It's not just a matter of finding the intro and exon boundaries, but it's a matter of finding all the intro and exon boundaries and how they are stitched together given that there is alternative splicing. Um, this is a way to, you know, so, so conceptually we tend to look at it this way, but another representation of this alternative splice is that it's a graph, that there's a particular set of graph uh, nodes that you can move through to stitch together this or this or this, and there are certain paths to this graph that, that lead to um, a particular 
transcript, these graphs by themselves can allow you to walk the graph in a way that actually you have no observed data for. So, so there are algorithmically ways to make restrictions on given that I've walked through this set of nodes, whether I can now walk through the next set of nodes in a certain way, which is to say that sometimes the upstream splicing pattern and the downstream splicing pattern are actually correlated. So if there are alternative splice events upstream and alternative splice downstream, you don't see all possible different combinations. You only see certain combinations of them that, that, that happen. So there are ways to build splice graphs based on the alignment evidence um, to capture that information. And then, of course, there must be yet another hidden Markov model that now takes into account that alignment evidence um, and tries to parse out all the various different um, alternative splicing events, multiple acceptors, multiple donors, multiple donors, double alternate internal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is from uh, uh, Steven Salzberg's group. Um, and it's an attempt, it's one of the first and probably only marginally successful attempts at, again, making a de novo call of the exon intern structure and alternative splice structure given a DNA sequence and some transcript alignment evidence. But remember, that transcript alignment evidence is rarely ever complete. It's not cDNA end to end, here's the whole transcript. It's a little bit here, a little bit there, maybe something over there. So it has to be combined jointly with, with the regular ab initio gene finder evidence, sort of evidence to, to piece it all together. Um, if you're in this world of, of, of annotation, there are a number of essentially GUI tools that you use to both work with, with the gene finder predictions and other sources of, of, of evidence. And I've listed a few up there. Apollo is really the one that continues to be the go-to annotation tool for, for eukaryotes. Um, and lastly, I'm very briefly going to talk about RNA gene finding. So far, I've only talked about protein coding gene finding. Of course, we do care about RNAs um, a little bit in this course. Um, the thing that we get to do with RNA is that not only do we have sequence conservation, but we also have secondary structural conservation. And it turns out that that secondary structure is a stronger signal, a stronger conservational signal that allows us to detect homology it's stronger than the sequence conservation itself. Because for many RNAs, um, it doesn't really matter what, what the loop base pairing is. They can both change as long as you maintain the loop, right? So usually the business end of the RNA is up here, and this structural bit is just essentially scaffolding, and the actual sequence is not so strongly conserved as is the secondary structure, OK? So there is another type of hidden Markov model um, that's used um, by this tool called, called Infernal that captures not only the sequence motif conservation, just like PFAM does in, uh, you know, from a sort of domain structure, but also the, um, the individual secondary structure, the, if you will, the, the kind of looping and, and, and branching of that. And so it turns out that you can, in any, I'm not sure if Bill talked about this, but in, in, in any motif or hidden Markov mo model, you can talk about, well, how much how much information is buried in that? How much, how much information content? We talked about bits in terms of a, a scoring matrix, how many bits you got per, per residue out of a scoring matrix. Similarly, you can talk about how many bits come out of a, out of a sequence profile. And for this multiple sequence alignment and this, this motif, there's about 14 bits worth of information. But from the secondary structure as well, we get uh, we get 17 bits. So the structure for this particular simple example, this little bit of structure gives us, gives us three more bits of information with which we can use to, to, do, to do a database search. Um, so in the, in the RFAM database, so just like there's PFAM, the protein family database, there's also an RFAM database, the, the, the RNA family database. Each one of these are examples of, of RFAM families um, every one of those HMMs has both a sequence profile bit and then a structural profile bit. And for some of these, you can see that, um, uh, that the structure doesn't add a whole lot. It adds a little bit. But some of these, the structural information, particularly for these, for these um, uh, RNases, um, the structural information is you know, nearly as, as good as the, as the, as the sequence. Information. I guess I said, I said that structure was more than sequence. 
it's, you know, the sequences actually are, are actually long. So for the sequences to be long, you get a, a fair amount of bits. But the, the amount of information per residue, if you would normalize these total um, scores and bits by the length of it, you would see that, that the amount of structural information you get per length is actually much, much larger than the, than the sequence information. Is it possible to do that for proteins as well? <sighs> Bill, is it possible to do that in proteins as well? Second, secondary structure. <coughs> so we're talking about non-coding RNAs and how we get yeah, more information so, out of secondary so, uh, structure. We are terrible at predicting secondary structure except based on uh, homology. So there's no way to get additional information. There's no secondary structure. There's no 18 G, U, G, C. What about, what about VAST, the, the uh, uh, structural search? Doesn't, isn't structural search more powerful than 3D search? OK, right. Okay. Ah, uh, I see, I see, so okay. You have, you know that, that RNA has secondary structure and you can predict it somewhat accurately. And we know that proteins have secondary structure, but they have lots of, they have more different kinds and we cannot predict it. But couldn't we, couldn't you um, thread every, you know, so any query sequence, thread that through all the different protein, the 3D protein structures and ask what's the likelihood that that, that, that sequence generated that 3D structure? So what you can do is um, take your sequence and compare it against all PFAM HMMs, and lots of the PFAM HMMs are going to have. Um, but that's but that's just sequence. That's that's just yeah, linear one D structure. They have, they have structure. So the the problem is that um, we don't we can't think about the energy and the threading and stuff like that. Our ability to discriminate um, correct from incorrect is much weaker than it is. Yeah. And we don't even have the statistical power to know whether or not um, you know, we have the best match and the second best match. It's not actually all that unusual for the second best match to be a completely different structure from the best match and not have a very different score. So in that, the, the threading prediction, there's just not as much information as you Plus, you're assuming that the structure is there. Right, but that's for, for, for these RNA sequences, we have a known structure and that's what, you know, part of the model is the expected structure. So, yeah. uh, so if we, if you, if you do a search, so, so that's right, so if I, I got a protein <coughs> and I've done a search against, um, uh, the known structure, proteins of, of, of known structure, and I haven't found anything significant. The next thing I would do is search against PFAM, which is going to go against all their hidden Markov models, which are more sensitive than simple pairwise comparison. And it's possible that I will have a hit against one of their hidden Markov models. And a large, a large fraction of their hidden Markov models have structures, because that was one of the things that they did in the structural genomics project. So that allows me to, um, so the best thing would be, I do my blast search, I find a structure with expectation value of 10 to minus 10, and I'm happy and I'm done. But when I don't do that, I then go against PFAM and do the same thing. And the other thing I do is I go and take my protein and I go against uh, some big database and I build a, a position-specific scoring matrix, and then I take that position-specific scoring matrix and I go against structures whose sequence, sequences whose structures are done. So I can kind of go from both directions. But in all of those things, I'm working in a place where we understand the statistics pretty well and we trust the expectation values. And when I get into the threading world, I'm not there anymore. Yeah, and I think, I think the other, I've been you know, uh, uh, trumpeting the value of, of the kind of hidden Markov model statistical model. And remember, one of the caveats there was that the labeling had to be this kind of categorical, right? Not, not continuous quantitative data. And so here, the structure is, you know, am I pair bonded or not? It's kind of a binary decision. Whereas in the protein 3D structure threading world, as Bill was, was alluding to, there's the folding energies and the kinetic energies and the, you know, those things are no longer, um, no longer categorical. They're now continuous quantitative data 
there are statistical models to deal with that, but it, essentially Bill's saying that, that they just don't work very well. There's no simple structure, you know, the simple sort of 2D alpha beta sheet aspects of, of protein sequence conservation don't, are, don't actually provide enough information, whereas the RNA uh, secondary structure, the stem loop forms do. Okay, so um, RFAM is another database like PFAM. It continues to grow and grow and grow. It has representation across bacteria, eukaryotes, viruses, and, and archaea. Um, lots of different families in it. Neat little database. There is now also a database uh, called DFAM, the DNA sequence uh, families, primarily eukaryotic transposable elements and, and other um, uh, mobile elements. So that's it. Um, eukaryotic gene prediction is still a hard problem to distinguish genes from the genome. Um, the challenge is alternative splicing. Pseudogenes, which we haven't talked about that much, but, but uh, remain an issue where you have retrotransposed uh, uh, gene structures that now are no longer under regulation, but they're still in the genome. And to a gene finder, they still look like they have some coding potential, even though they may be full of stop codons and, and other sorts of things. Um, the non-coding RNA detection is limited by the fact that the sequences are still pretty short. Um, and so there's not a lot of sequence, you know, getting that kind of bits per residue, getting that statistical expectation to come up. As we scan across the genome, there's lots of DNA that happens to look like a microRNA, by the way, if you're in that, into, into that world. Do we have anyone who's studying microRNA? Sort of, maybe? Okay, okay, yeah. So, so microRNA target identification is something that, that people struggle with, again, because the microRNAs are so small. It's easy to find what looks like a putative target, microRNA target sequence in the, in the, in the UTRs of some target genes that, that may or may not be real. So there's lots of false positives there because of that sort of short sequence business. Um, the big annotation pipelines, Ensemble and, and USC, are the ones that, that I think most of us are familiar with using the annotations from incredibly complicated, integrating many, many algorithms. If you have your own eukaryotic genome of, of interest that you'd like to annotate, Maker is the tool for you. Maker is the tool that will take a bunch of RNA-seq data and run some gene predictions and do something like Glean does to put them together into, into a canonical set of, of, of transcripts. Will RNA-seq eliminate our need for all these other tools? We can just, just sequence the RNA and just know the answer. And we'll talk about that, I guess not Saturday, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning when we talk about RNA-seq. All good. So James is going to talk at four, so that's seven minutes. <laughs>